830 and uh, we are again getting together to celebrate vision research. Unfortunately, we were kicked out from uh, a room in uh, Gavin Herbert. So today we have to split into uh, three different rooms uh, to uh, lower uh, traffic a little bit. So I'm sorry for that. Uh, that is not conducive to build unity in the group, but uh, that's how it is. Saying that, we have a great news today because we have our friend from Buffalo, Dr. Ma, uh, one of the leaders in the field, uh, who is going to tell us uh, about his research. But before we move on, uh, I will just ask John to do more formal introduction. Dr. Ma, thank you so much for joining us. We're really, truly delighted to see you today at the seminar. Thank you, Chris. Hello, it is uh, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Xu Qin Mu, professor in the Department of Ophthalmology at the Ross I Institute Jacobs School of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences, SUNY Buffalo. Uh, Dr. Ma received his uh, medical degree in, at Qindao Medical College. He then received his PhD in uh, biochemistry and molecular biology at the Institute of Basic Medical Science at Peking Uni Union Medical College. After receiving both his MD and PhD, he came from China as a postdoctoral fellow to the NIH to work in the labs of Dr. Edward Cuff and then Dr. Alan Kimmel. He then furthered his postdoctoral training at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center at the lab of Dr. William Klein. Dr. Ma's research in the developmental biology studying uh, Dr. Moot Ma's research is on the developmental biology, studying the neural retina as a model system with a focus on retinal ganglion cells to understand differentiation going from progenitor cells to complex systems. He then he has been di diving into the landscape of transcription factors, epigenetic transcriptional regulation, and translational regulation via mRNA -A to answer many of these questions. Dr. Ma has uh, published numerous articles in journals such as Science Advances, Nature Communications, PNAS, Journal of Neuroscience, and Cellular and Molecular Life Sciences. He has written, he has written various reviews and book chapters on developmental biology and retinal ganglion cell development. He has been invited to speak at ARVO, Peking Union Medical College, Gordon Research Conference, Columbia University, Harvard, UCLA, Jules Stein Eye Institute. Dr. Ma has received numerous honors and awards such as the Bright Focus Foundation Award, Glaucoma Foundation Award, and the Matilda Ziegler Foundation for Blindness Award. Without further ado, it is my it is our pleasure to have Dr. Ma with us today, with us here today. Uh, great. Uh, can you can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, very kind introduction. And also, I want to thank um, uh, this opportunity, for, you know, for being invited to present my work as this, you know, prestigious, uh, you know, uh, institute. Uh, so, um, uh, the research or the focus of research in my lab uh, is really on the genetic and the epigenetic mechanisms underlying cell differenti uh, differentiation, particularly the differentiation of renal ganglion cells during development. And this really is part of a bigger question, which is the formation of the cellular diversity in the central nervous system. As you know, many of you know that the retina is a part of the central nervous system. And this diversity of uh, cellular diversity actually uh, was recognized more than hundred years ago, you know, by this great you know, pioneer of modern neuroscience, Raymond uh, Cajal. And as shown here is, you know, a, a very, um, uh, a drawing, you know, by him off of the neural retina. You can see that even at that time, you know, he had a very good, uh, you know, depiction of the cellular uh, composition of the neural retina with all the major uh, uh, neuronal classes being recognized. 
And on the right, it's just a more modern version uh, of the cellular com uh, composition uh, uh, from uh, a uh, review written by the late uh, Dick Maslin. Even this, you know, is more than 20 years old. And you can see there are uh, very diverse, uh, you know, uh, uh, cell types in the retina. And uh, you can divide them into, you know, six major uh, 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 classes of neurons. And, um, and you can see even within each class, you know, there are different uh, types or subtypes. Um, and with uh, advance, you know, of technology, particularly uh, with the, you know, advent of uh, single uh, cell uh, technologies, single cell RNA-seq, uh, the inventory, you know, of uh, cellular composition is essentially complete. Uh, for example, in the mouse, uh, just for the ganglion cells, which is, you know, the cell type I'm interested in, there are more than 40 um, uh, subtypes or types in the retina. So the question really is how this cellular diversity, you know, uh, uh, comes about during development. And that's the question we are trying to address. And this question, you know, can be better uh, illustrated here. Um, so in the center is a section of, you know, the neural retina uh, of a mature neural retina that you all are very uh, are familiar. So in the mature retina, you have the different cell types like photoreceptors, uh, uh, interneurons, and the ganglion cells that are located you know, in the different uh, uh, parts of the retina. And these cell types you know, form a neural circuit so that uh, uh, visual function uh, can be you know, accomplished when we see things, you know, light comes in from this side. On the other hand, if you look at the embryonic retina, this is what they like. There are no layers. Uh, basically, it's just a composed a pool or a population of so-called retinal progenitor cells. So during development, all these, you know, uh, different cell types are derived <laughs> from this population or this um, shared population uh, of retinal progenitor cells. And uh, as I mentioned, we are uh, our uh, focus has been on the retinal ganglion cells which are the only output to the neuron that connects the retina uh, to the brain where the optic nerve. So although all the uh, retinal cell types, you know, are derived from a single pool of retinal progenitor cell, but they don't all come about at the same time. And as shown here, um, you can see that uh, there is a sequential order uh, of birth of the different cell types. And in, actually in all vertebrate species, ganglion cells are, all, uh, are always you know, the first type to be generated. But on the other hand, what you can see is that there are actually two major waves of cell type uh, uh, cell differentiation. Uh, and in the mouse, the first wave happens mostly before birth, and the second will happen mostly after birth. Uh, and the ganglion cells belong to the first wave. And uh, within this wave, you have other cell types being born as well, uh, also including you know, horizontal cells, cones, amicron cells, right? So there are two uh, questions that arise from this diagram. The first is that how these you know, different cell types uh, are generated you know, uh, what's the mechanism underlying the generation of the different cell types through different time? And it has been believed uh, that the retina uh, progenitor goes through kind of a competency change so that the early progenitor cells are competent for only the early cell types, the uh, late uh, progenitor cells are competent for only uh, the late cell types. Actually, there has been quite some progress in that area. But the other question, which is more of uh, I'm interested in, is that you can see at any given time, there are always multiple cell types being generated. So the question here is how a renal progenitor uh, cell, you know, make a decision to adopt one of these different cell types. That's what we are interested in. 
Uh, and again, you know, just to emphasize, we are uh, helping, you know, focusing on the ganglion cells. Uh, this is what happens at the cellular level uh, during random ganglion cell uh, differentiation or RGC differentiation. So this is what the random progenitor cells look like. You can see they all have a long uh, processes uh, anchored at both sides of the retina and they are highly proliferated. And uh, interestingly, their cell, cell body actually oscillates back and forth, depending on where they are in the cell cycle. So in the M phase, their cell, cell body is always located on the apical side. And so, so proliferation has uh, to happen so that uh, enough cells can be generated for the mature retina. But at the same time, some of them will become uh, competent for differentiation. And this so-called competent progenitor cells will then uh, adopt one of the cell phase. If they become ganglion cells, they will express markers for ganglion cells and then migrate to the inner side to further differentiate into mature uh, RGCs. And you can see this is a stepwise process. And each process is actually marked, uh, each step is actually marked by individual uh, markers or proteins. And shown here are two of them, A27 and the pol 52 So A27 marks this competent. We also call them transitional renal progenitor cells. And it is from this competent progenitor cells that the ganglion cells emerge by beginning to express another marker, pol 52 So these are newly born ganglion cells. They are still expressing both A27 and pol 52 And these newly born ganglion cells will then migrate to the inner side. They will then lose expression of A27 by maintaining expression of pol 52 and further differentiate into mature neurons. So, um, I should say that this is a highly regulated process, and uh, this is largely uh, an uh, the regulator mechanism is largely intrinsic. Somehow, I'm not being able to advance my slide. Uh, hold on a second. Okay, let me restart it. Okay, here we go. And as I just mentioned, so this is a, 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 a mostly an intrinsic process. By that, I mean transcription factors in, uh, within the cells play um, uh, the major roles. So, um, and as you can imagine, as uh, actually I just mentioned that they go through different steps and many, many transcription factors that are functioning at this different step have been uh, uh, identified. Some of them, you know, have been studied um, extensively. Others, you know, we only know their expression. We don't know much about them. And I'm um, just highlighting some of them that uh, my group have been uh, studied, you know, over the years, including A27, ISL1, pol 52 and also the one-cut trans uh, transcription factors. And the function of this, uh, conventionally, the function of this, uh, transcription factors have been uh, uh, analyzed mostly through genetic uh, approaches. And this, I should say, has been uh, studied by multiple uh, groups uh, in uh, many different species, actually, including, you know, vertebrates, uh, zebrafish, uh, I mean, including zebrafish, xenopus, chicken, mice, and even, you know, in renal organoids, you know, uh, human renal organized in these days. So I'm just highlighting uh, some of these studies. And uh, you, uh, what I want to point out is that uh, three of these uh, four panels are actually from papers that uh, were published uh, in, uh, from my uh, former uh, uh, postdoc uh, supervisor, the late Dr. Uh, Bill Collins group at uh, MD Anderson uh, Cancer Center. He passed away, unfortunately, a couple of years ago. So 
uh, uh, this one was by Dr. Stephen Wang. This is by uh, Dr. Lin Gang, and this one uh, on Isla Wang was by myself. What you can see here is if you take away A to seven, you essentially compared to the control, you essentially don't have any uh, gang at all. So it has long believed that A to seven is critical or essential for the establishment of the ganglion cell lineage. So remember that we'll come back to this point. And the POL52 and IS1, ISL1 are downstream. So when you knock them out, initially the ganglion cells can still be born, but they don't last. So if you check them at a later stage for either POL52 or IS1, what you see is that the majority of them are lost. And other than that, other transcription factors, such as, uh, such as one cut one and two, function downstream. They have more specific roles, you know, in ganglion cell differentiation. Therefore, when you knock out uh, one cut one and two, which function redundantly, you only have a relatively mild phenotype. You only have a loss of 30% of the ganglion cell. So this kind of studies, um, actually those are a lot of function studies. We have also performed some uh, ecto ectopic uh, expression analysis. Uh, and, and here, showing here, using a binary gen uh, genetic approach by knocking in this artificial TTA uh, transcription factor into the A to seven locus so that you create a situation that the A to seven is not cut out, but TDA is expressed from the A to seven locus. And you can cross this line with another transgenic line, which can express pol 5 2 and IS1 together um, under, you know, in the presence of a TTA. Therefore, the A to seven TTA mice are A to seven now, therefore you don't have ganglion cells. But on the other hand, when you cross this with this allele, you are ectopically expressing POL52 and ISO1. And now you are getting ganglion cells back. And this is just using uh, the optic nerve as a readout for this because uh, 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 the uh, uh, axons in the optic nerve you know, are from ganglion cells only. Therefore, you don't have an optic nerve in the 807 TTA over TTA, but you have a almost normal operating nerve when you uh, ectopically express ISL1 and the pop up to gene uh, cells normally expressing 807. So this uh, kind of studies uh, together uh, with you know many of the uh, expression uh, profiling uh, experiments that we have performed not from, uh, just from my lab, you know, from many other labs, allowed us to establish, you know, a regulatory uh, cascade that controls ganglion cells by placing P transcription factors in the different uh, phases or different steps of ganglion cell development. So you have PAC6 and notch, uh, the notch pathway. This is just the two of them. And uh, in proliferating progenitor cells, you have A to seven and the likely SOC C, uh, the SOC C factors in competent or transitional uh, renal progenitor cells. And it, the role of these uh, transcription factors is to activate this group of transcription factor genes. And once these uh, genes are activated, they will function together to activate the whole uh, gene uh, expression program, uh, program for ganglion cell differentiation. So this is uh, nice, you know, right? Uh, regarding, you know, uh, understanding the genetic process regulating ganglion cell differentiation. But what we did not know was what is, this, is the relationship of this lineage versus the other lineages that are being generated at the same time, right? This has been difficult to do actually. And also we wanted to understand 
how these transcription factors carry out their function. So for, fortunately, um, single cell technologies came along and uh, like many other labs, we performed you know, single cell RNA-seq analysis. Uh, and uh, I should point out, you know, most of the data presented is at around E17.5. This is where the first wave of cell differentiation, uh, cell differentiation happens, uh, including you know, differentiation of the ganglion cells. So what is the single cell uh, RNA seq analysis allowed us to do was to identify the steps or state, cell, cell states along the trajectory of the individual lineages. For example, for the ganglion cell lineage, you start with, we call them naive random progenitor cells. You go through a state called the transitional RPCs, and then uh, from them uh, uh, comes about the so-called early RGCs or early RGC pr uh, precursors. And these cells will then further differentiate into functional RGCs. And you can say the same thing for the other lineages, including photoreceptors, parental cells, and embryo cells. And each state is marked by a group of genes that are specifically uh, expressed there, shown here are some of them for the ganglion cell lineage. Uh, one thing you, you may notice, and which is actually really significant, uh, was our finding that before the cells adopt any of these lineages, they all go through this shared transitional RPC state. And we looked a little bit closer, and what we saw was that these cells in this state co-express many of the genes that are required for the different lineages including 807 and SOX11 for ganglion cells, uh, and NeuroD and OTX2 for photoreceptors, one cot Foxin4 for horizontal cells, uh, and amicron cells. And these cells also co-express many of the components of the notch pathway. And the notch pathway actually is a critical pathway that plays a, uh, an important role in the transition from pro proliferation to differentiation. So that's not very surprising here. And, and this is just another way to visualize this. You can see 807 being expressed in the transitional uh, RPCs. And so are neural D1 and the OTX2. Just to remind you again, 807 is required for the ganglion cells, but neural D1 and our, uh, OTX2 are required for photoreceptors. And this is just, a, uh, further confirmation by co-labeling, uh, a co-immunophorescence labeling uh, of A to seven with uh, several of these uh, uh, marker uh, genes. And uh, just uh, to kind of uh, emphasize, uh, you see A to seven and OTX2 are co-expressed <laughs> in a subset of renal progenitor cells, but are not in cells that have become uh, photoreceptors. So here you only have OTX2. And this is interesting, and I will come back because this has to do likely with how the transitional RPCs decide which way to go or what cell types are to become. And another important finding uh, from our single cell study was that it revised our view actually on the role of A to seven in uh, uh, ganglion cell uh, genesis. Re uh, just just um, I remind you, you know, I, I, as I said earlier, that it has long believed that A to seven is essential for the ganglion cell lineage. What it was uh, thought was that if you don't ha have A to seven, you don't have ganglion cells generated at all. But that turned out not to be the case because if you compare the wild type with the 807 now retina in the single cell analysis, you see this ganglion cell lineage is still there. Just that the trajectory of the ganglion cells don't go as far 
as in the wild type. And we look at the cell um, numbers, and you can see the early state, which represents this uh, uh, part. The cell numbers really don't change much, They're very comparable. But if you look at further along the trajectory, you see a significant uh, reduction. So what we think happens is that the cells actually are pushed in the absence of AT7 still toward the ganglion cell lineage, but somehow they just don't, uh, you know, last. And this can be explained actually by looking at the expression of many of the ganglion cell specific genes. Although many of them, you know, are not expressed at all. For example, POP2 and this is CIST4 in the mutant. But many others are still expressed at the substantial levels. Some even express at higher levels. And uh, you also see mis-expression of some of the genes. So we think that this residual level of expression of these many other genes uh, is the reason that this ganglion cell lineage still exists in the A27 knockout. But because of the reduced expression and also um, the mis-expression of many of the other genes, these cells eventually die. Uh, and this also tells us likely other than A27, there are other transcription factors that are functioning at the same level. So we'll come back to this a little bit later. This is all good. Um, but what we really wanted to understand as I uh, stated earlier was how the transcription factors interact, interact with the genome or with the chromatin to carry out their functions. So for that purpose, our first um, emphasis was on enhancers because these are the DNA, element, uh, DNA elements, as you know, that drives or decides when and where you know, a gene is uh, expressed or activated. Just to remind you some of the properties of DNA enhancers. So this, um, uh, as I just said, uh, DNA elements, and they are um, bound by specific uh, factors, uh, sometimes transcription factors, and uh, they are um, associated with histones that are specifically modified. For example, this key uh, 27 acetylation marker is a, is a specific active uh, enhancer marker. They are also expressed in the form of enhancer RNA or eRNA. And also, the, <coughs> excuse me, the enhancer elements tend to be uh, in an open uh, status, meaning they are more accessible to enzyme. So all these activities uh, or properties have been utilized to identify enhancers uh, in a global manner. Uh, and initially, you know, people used uh, a chip seq uh, and also people have used the DNAs, like a DNAs1 to probe the open uh, regions. Uh, and we were not able to do that because we were limited by the numbers uh, of cells that are available, you know, in the uh, developing retina. And unfortunately, a new techno uh, uh, technique came along, and uh, I, I'm sure by now you all know this, which is called attack seek. Uh, and this assay also utilizes the property of the enhancers of being in an open state, and it, it utilizes this uh, TNA5 transposes to attack, to actually make a cut at open chromatin regions. Not just that, but also to tag them with specific you know, uh, sequences. So this allows us to, uh, to isolate you know, DNA uh, fragments from these enhancer regions and uh, amplify them because they are tagged and then sequence them. You can then uh, map them back to the genome to identify the locations, uh, locations of the enhancers. 
So the advantage as I just said of this technology is that you really don't need a lot of materials. And also you can do that at a single cell level. So we did that with, again, you know, with the E14.5 um, RENAS. And uh, then we did a clustering, uh, uh, just, you know, the standard, uh, you know, uh, dimension reduction clustering. And this is the result. What you can see here, compared to what I showed you with the single cell RNA-seq data, is that this is essentially recapitulating what I was observed, you know, the uh, 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 developmental trajectories of the different cell types at this stage. So you have, for, for example, for the ganglion cell lineage, you start from the naive progenitor cells, going through the transitional RPCs, and then through the early RGCs and the later RGCs. Uh, I should point out that we also have mutant, eight or seven mutant cells in this uh, analysis. And actually the early RGCs for the wild type, which is the yellow cells and the mutant cells, which are the blue cells, are actually separated. Meaning in the absence of A27, uh, the uh, chromatin uh, or the epigenetic status somehow is changed. So what this allows us to do is to see how the epigenetic landscape shifts along individual uh, lineage trajectories. For example, for along the ganglion cell trajectories. And what you see is that groups of enhancers are open at a state, uh, specific states. And as the development progresses or the lineage progresses, and the early group of enhancers get close, and the new group of enhancers get uh, open or activated. And this keeps going until you know, the ganglion cells are uh, generated. And uh, so it is likely that the epigenetic shifts along individual trajectories are responsible for the changes of gene expression in the different uh, states. And, and that uh, I think seems to be the case because when we look at the genes that are known to uh, be expressed in specific states, we were almost always able to identify enhancers that are active just in that state. So this group of genes are specifically uh, active. In naive random progenitor cells, you can see them to be most active in naive progenitor cells. And these are genes that are known to be most active in the transitional RPCs. You can see they are turned on once they enter the state of transitional RPCs. We have also identified enhancers that are specific for RGCs, uh, I mean, associated with RGC genes, associated with horizontal cells and amicron cells, and also photoreceptors. We were actually also able to do this at a global level uh, by performing so-called peak to gene analysis, uh, linkage analysis. This is to look at the dynamics of gene expression based on single cell RNA-seq data and the dynamics of the peaks that are in the neighborhood of the genes. So for the E14.5 data, we were able to identify uh, more than 50, 000, uh, uh, 55,000 uh, search links. And what this allows us to do is for any given gene, you can go to in, uh, into the genome and look at the genome browser and identify potential enhancers. And this is just a two example of them. Uh, A to seven, you can see these are the enhancers linked by you know, these lines uh, uh, that suggesting that these enhancers are likely uh, involved in the regulation of A to seven. And this is the OTX2. Again, many, many enhancers are identified through this analysis. What I would like to point out is that for both genes, so the enhancers, that are identified this way are both uh, have both been you know experimentally studied 
previously. So validating, you know, this is a really uh, a, uh, 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 you know, a, a good approach. So what we, um, as I mentioned earlier, really wanted to do was to understand how this shape shifts of the epigenetic landscape uh, happens. And that is likely um, driven by transcription factors. Right, and this is just another way uh, to uh, uh, visualize the enhancers that are specifically active in the different states. And uh, again, we have both the wild type and also the eight to seven mutant uh, groups. And then you can see there's a marked difference in indicating indeed that the trans uh, eight to seven is involved in modulating you know, the trans, uh, epigenetic landscape. We also look at these uh, you know, enhancer regions to identify enriched DNA motifs recognized by transcription factors. And also to our gratif uh, gratification, we were able to identify motifs recognized by transcription factors that are known to be functional in specific states, cell states, including VSX2, RAX, LHX2, SOC2 for the naive progenitor cells, um, like a pol 5 2 for the ganglion cells, OTX2 and the CRX for the photoreceptors. Again, you know, this is a really gratifying. But on the other hand, we, um, don't know exactly where these transcription factors actually die, uh, bind in the genome. So we wanted to do that uh, or to, to have that information. Again, you know, because uh, this becomes available because of, you know, uh, new technologies being developed. And in this case, the technique is called cousin tech. Uh, uh, this is actually very uh, similar uh, to a taxi except it's more specific. So what it does is it utilizes a specific antibody to recognize you know, a protein of your interest, either a histone marker or a transcription factor. You then use a fusion protein, a TNA5 transpose a fusion protein to bind to that specific antibody. And the excessive uh, uh, fusion protein, the protein A ten five uh, fusion protein can then be washed away. You can then activate the TN five transposes by basically just adding magnesium. So this allows you to just uh, isolate DNA fragments that are bound only uh, uh, bound by you know only uh, specific transcription factors. And uh, so, so again, you know, this uh, we are able to do the uh, the reason we wanted to do this is because you can do this with a very small number of cells, and that's our limitation. So the first two transcription factors we did uh, were a two seven and OTX two, uh, the reason being because they are co-expressed as I mentioned to you earlier in the transitional renal progenitor cells. And this is the stage just to remind you of a multipotency. The cells are ready to differentiate, but I have not. And, um, and also, as I just mentioned, they co express transcription factors for multiple lineages, including A27 and uh, uh, OTX2. A27 is for ganglion cells, OTX2 is for photoreceptors. So uh, actually, you know, before our study, there have been, you know, uh, uh, some study uh, that have math, matched, you know, uh, I mean, map the A to seven binding sites, including, uh, you know, a study by uh, your own uh, Dorota, uh, who used a chip and chip, you know, some uh, years ago. But what we wanted to do here is to see in uh, the, not just the enhancers, but, Bound by these transcription uh, factors, 
but also where uh, they are active. So the way we did it, we identify the peaks that are bound by A to seven, for example. We then intersected the, those peaks with our single cell ataxic data. So that allowed us not just to identify those enhancers, but also to see their activities. So the 807 enhancers, as you can see, are most active in the transition RPC. And that's where it's expressed. And it's not surprising, but it's very uh, gratifying. Um, and and uh, one thing I would like to point out is that, again, uh, the, the enhancers, the activity of the enhancers, sort of surprise actually, are not so different in the A to seven knockout cells as compared to the mutant. So what this means is that these enhancers are likely not just regulated by A to seven. Okay, so A to seven are not. I mean, in the ab absence of this uh, A to seven, most of the uh, uh, the activity of most of the these enhancers don't change. But on the uh, other hand, we did a motif search uh, enrichment analysis, and we were able to find that the top motif that are enriched in these enhancers are indeed an E box that's bound by A to seven. We did the same thing with OTX2. And I, again, you can see uh, the OTX2 uh, enhancers, are many of them are most active in the transition RPCs. But also some of them are only or most active in the photoreceptors. This is consistent actually with uh, the uh, fact that is no OTX function at both stages. And again, we did a motif enriched manner analysis. We found the top motif to be that for OTX2 and CRX, which are two related proteins. What you also notice here is that in the A207 enhancers, the CRX2, OTI, uh, CRX, OTX2 motif is also enriched. And then in the OTX2 enhancers, A207 motif is also enriched. So we were kind of uh, surprised or maybe not, uh, but that suggests that maybe many of these enhancers are co-bound by A207 and OTX2. And that turns out to be the case because when we intersect or compare these two sets of enhancers, we see many of them, you know, are uh, code bound by these two factors. But the difference, or uh, uh, one thing I want to point out here is that these enhancers are most active in the transitional RPCs, but they don't include enhancers that are just in, uh, active in the photoreceptors. So suggesting that the interaction of A207 and, uh, and OTX2 are actually in the transitional RPCs. And when we look at the genes that are associated with these enhancers, what we found were those genes include those that are involved in the uh, differentiation of all the cell types that are being generated at the time, including RGCs, uh, photoreceptors, parental cells, and amacron cell genes. And also the uh, component genes of the notch pathway. And uh, you may notice that those genes include OT, uh, A27 and the OTX2 themselves. And uh, this is the actual uh, brother uh, gene track. And uh, you can see that for A27, uh, it binds to its own enhancers, which is not surprising because this kind of auto regulation happens all the time uh, during development. But you also see OTX2 binding to many of the um, A27 enhancers, uh, although not all of them. 
And it's the same situation for OTS2. You see auto regulation or auto binding of OTS2 to its own enhancers. But you also see um, binding of A A27 to many of these enhancers, but not to all of them. So what does this mean? Remember that the two transcription characters um, function in this state, the transitional RPCs that are, have not decided which way to go. But A27 pushes the cells, the transitional RPCs to the ganglion cell phase, but OTX2 pushes them to the photoreceptor phase. So the only reasonable interpretation of this data is that OTX2 and A27 mutually repress each other. And also the genes are associated with the two different phases. Uh, so, so, so that I think is a major finding. It's really, you know, a key uh, provides a key insight regarding, you know, how the different cell phase uh, came out from this multipotent transitional state. And uh, we are also interested in, as I mentioned, you know, how the ganglion cell specific genes are activated. So, therefore, we did a content test for the downstream transcription factor, both F2 and ISL1 as well. And we did the same uh, intersection analysis. Now, what you can see is that the enhancers are specific to the RGC uh, lineage. So the early RGCs, the late, later RGCs. And also, um, Compared to what I just told you regarding the enhancer bonded by A to seven, these enhancers now are affected by the uh, absence uh, of, I'm sorry, by the absence of A to seven. So you can see there is a significant reduction in terms of the activity of these enhancers by, uh, bonded by either POP52 or ISL1. So what that means is that A to seven seems to selectively influence or regulate the activity of just a subset of enhancers they bound, which are involved in ganglion cell differentiation. Um, so we did the same motif analysis. You can see, uh, again, you know, uh, uh, the uh, top enriched motif for the pop 2 enhancers, indeed is a pop 2 enhancer, and the top enriched motif for the IS-01 enhancers is indeed the IS-01 enhancer. But you can also see other motifs are also enriched, uh, indicating that many of the enhancers are regulated in a combinatorial fashion. And this is just, you know, kind of a, a, uh, 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 showing, you know, the overlap of this sets of enhancers. For, for example, this G2 are enhancers that are bound by all three transcription factors. Uh, I mean, this is G1. Uh, G2 is uh, by A27 and pop 5 2 uh, This is just uh, a uh, uh, one diagram of the genes associated with this uh, three sets of uh, uh, enhancers. And what this tells us is that those genes that are expressed in um, uh, ganglion cells, or specifically expressed in ganglion cells, they are differentially actually uh, uh, active, uh, regulated. So they receive a different combination of upstream uh, uh, inputs. So our, our effort continues. So because we wanted to systematically map the binding size of enhancers, uh, I mean, ideally, most uh, all of them, but at least most of them. This is just uh, uh, some recent uh, data for uh, six additional transcription factors, and uh, I just want to point out that uh, there the enhancers, you know, uh, that the, this trans uh, transcription factors bind are specific in terms of their known activity. So uh, enhancers bound by pop 5 2 which is related to, to I mean, pop 5 one which is related to pop 5 2 and the EBF1 are specific to the ganglion cell uh, uh, lineage or states. CRX, 
which I alluded uh, already is a, is a photoreceptor uh, transcription factor. So it enhances a specifically active in photoreceptors. And one kind of one and two are involved in multiple lineages. So you can see their activity uh, to be most, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, maximal in multiple lineages. I should point out that these two, you know, function redundantly. But if you look at the profile, the, the enhancers they bind, they are very, very similar, you know, uh, supporting the validity of our analysis. And neural D1, uh, as I mentioned to you, is mostly involved in photoreceptor analysis. But again, you can see its activity to be most active, you know, in transitional RPCs because that's where it is expressed. So um, all this data, you know, give us, you know, provides a, a, a very good resource for us uh, to uh, study, you know, the regulation of individual genes. This is important because we need to understand how the key regulators are activated so that we can understand, you know, how uh, the, you know, uh, regulation of individual cell uh, phase occur. And one of the gene, you know, will be interested in, in for a long time is POP2 itself. And what I'm showing here are data of kind of step for H3K27 uh, acetylation, which marks active enhancers, and also the kind of TAP data of OTX2, A27, POP2, as well as the single cell uh, ataxic data. So we were able to identify uh, 11. Uh, and candidate enhancers over a long range uh, in the genome. Uh, it's around 400 uh, kb actually to be exact. And many of them are embedded in this neighbor gene, TTC27, uh, I mean 29. Uh, some are over uh, uh, them. And, and uh, the enhancers are differentially bound by this transcription uh, factor. For example, this one's just bound by 807. And this one just bound by pop two, and also many of them are dependent on eight to seven because their activity are reduced in the eight to seven knockout. Um, right. So um, we're beginning to experimentally uh, validate the activities of the enhancers, and this is the first uh, group of enhancers we knocked out, and uh, including one, two, three, and the six, you can see um, that the changes of activities was very, very, very mild. And we were kind of uh, frustrated uh, uh, somewhat, but this one is uh, um, uh, expected because it is known that many of the developmental genes are regulated by multiple enhancers that are redundant. So, so although you see some changes, but you know, uh, the overall expression in terms of timing is still there. But we are not deterred. Um, so this is our recent, uh, most recent uh, deletion analysis of these three enhancers together from nine to 11. And now you can see there is a significant reduction of uh, the expression of pop and not just that, you can see the optic nerve, which as uh, I mentioned to you, as a readout of organic cells, is significantly reduced uh, as compared to the control. This is essentially um, phenocopies, actually the, the knockout. <coughs> uh, this is just uh, some further analysis using antibody to see uh, expression of pop 2 So uh, uh, consistent with the in situ, I just show you, you see, at the E12.5, pop L2 failed to be expressed, although there's some catch up at the E14.5, but its level is still significantly reduced. And also importantly, uh, and consistent with the knockout of pop L2, we see reduced number of ganglion cells at a later stage. And this is likely due to the down regulation of the downstream genes of POP F2, as shown here, uh, uh, of the expression of POP F1, which is a known downstream target for POP F2. You can see, although it's still expressed, but at a much uh, uh, you know, uh, lower level 
and multiple genes likely are, are, are um, affected. So we, 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 our effort continues. You know, our, our hope is you know, by this kind of study, we'll eventually have a better uh, understanding regarding how these multiple transcription factors function together to first activate the gene and then maintain its expression. Okay, uh, that's um, essentially all I, I uh, wanted to uh, tell you today. Uh, this is just a kind of a summary. Uh, so basically, um, what I told you is that, you know, through conventional uh, genetic studies, uh, many, many key regulators function in the different states, uh, cell states along the ganglion cell lineage have been identified. And a single cell analysis, you know, single cell RNA-seq and single cell uh, taxi really has to provide, you know, unprecedented uh, insights into this process. One of the key findings from our study happens here. So we think our data suggests that the transcription factors that are involved in different lineages and co-expressed in here compete or mutually repress each other so that eventually one cell fate will win out. So once it uh, becomes, you know, one uh, uh, cell fate, it, it, it gets to a point of no return and further differentiate it into, you know, uh, the individual cell ty types, such as the renal ganglion cells. And the activation of the renal ganglion cell genes, in this case, will involve in many downstream transcription factors, but they function likely, you know, in a combinatorial uh, fashion. But obviously, this is just the beginning, and we, um, uh, you know, there are still a lot we don't know. For example, here we essentially don't know, you know, what's happened at this, you know, uh, uh, naive renal progenitor cell state. We also don't know how this transits uh, transits into this uh, transitional uh, renal but, progenitor state. Although we know that the notch pathway plays a key role here. And, and also we have only studied just the two transcription factors here. Remember there are multiple transcription factors uh, expressed there and also more cell phase that are involved. So, the, I mean, clearly there's a lot of work uh, to be done, but this kind of Technology, you know, will allow us, you know, to get a, a much better uh, picture in terms of understanding the uh, underlying both genetic and epigenetic mechanisms involved. Hopefully, you know, in the near future. And uh, with that, I just want to uh, acknowledge some of the people involved. So, Yi Chen and Fu Guo are, are uh, the drivers for the experimental part of the single cell RNA-seq and the single cell RTAC-seq. Uh, Nene, uh, Tolu, Jiawang are the, and also Jonathan are the key um, bioinformatic uh, uh, personnel. So there are collaborators and I cannot emphasize uh, more um, regarding their roles, you know, in uh, uh, us to get a uh, full understanding of the data. Uh, we actually uh, obtained. Uh, and uh, our um, uh, research is supported by grants from the NIH. And uh, that's all I have. And uh, with that, I want to thank you all for your attention. And uh, I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much. Uh, we have uh, several questions. Let's start with the Zoom. And the first question will go to Henry Clausen. <coughs> Henry? Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Uh, yeah, lovely data. I was uh, very interested in this. Now, um, we're working with something that's more akin to a late retinal progenitor and it's from humans, so there may be some differences here, um, but I have a particular interest in the SOX2 expression. Uh, you noted that SOX2 is expressed in the uh, 
what you're calling the naive retinal progenitor. Um, and certainly our cells express SOX2 as well. Um, and then you mentioned that as the cells transition to the uh, transitional RPC, um, that the SOX2 disappears and um, other markers show up like the ATO7. Um, I'm wondering how close that um, the change in SOX2 and the change in mitosis uh, really correlates. Is that as tight as it looks in the diagram? In other words, does SOX2 expression really disappear uh, abruptly and other markers show up uh, immediately following, um, or can it be a little more blurry? Um, and um, have, have you looked at this transition for late progenitors? Um, in other words, uh, I saw in your one of your last slides there that you talked about um, OTX2 and NeuroD1 as markers for uh, presumably late photoreceptor or late RPC or photoreceptor type cells. Um, so, is there data on that, and is it published? Thank you. I, I'll just answer the uh, first answer the uh, first question regarding uh, SOX2. So you can see here. SOX2 actually does not turn off, uh, you know, completely. It, 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 clearly, it, it goes down, you know, in the transition RC, uh, our, uh, uh, RPCs, but it is most highly expressed in the naive uh, renal progenitor cells. And during this transition, there is indeed a change of a cell cycle uh, or cell proliferation because these cells are, are actively uh, proliferating. But once they get to this transitional state, um, they are <laughs> either out of a cell cycle already or they only just divide once. So, so they're ready to be out of the cell, cell cycle and are ready to differentiate. So SOX2 clear has some role in this because you knock out SOX2 and actually, the so same for a group of transcription factors that are expressed in the naive uh, renal progenitor cell. You knock them out, you will sin significantly reduce proliferation or cell division. So, so that clearly sucks to plays uh, an important role. Uh, but how it does that is not a very well known. And, and I think that's why we need um, you know, similar studies, single cell, you know, ataxic and kind of tag to identify the targets um, they regulate uh, so that we can have, you know, a better clue. Uh, regarding the late progenitor cells, there have been studies. So I, I mentioned uh, there, uh, my group is, was not, not the only one that has done this kind of analysis uh, and the other group, groups have done both mouse and a human, uh, you know, a single cell uh, RNA seq context, particularly, you know, uh, a CS blood shots group at the, uh, Hopkins. Uh, and um, so the, there's, a, I mean, it's a similar uh, uh, scenario. It's just uh, uh, my group, you know, hasn't uh, uh, spent too much time on the later progenitor cells because we're interested in the ganglion cells and that, you know, happens. As a, uh, the early phase. All right, that, thank you. Yeah, I hope that answers your question. All right, uh, let's move to Dorota. Hi. Dorota. Hi, hi. Wonderful, wonderful work and uh, beautiful data. And especially, oh. I'm very uh, happy about pushing towards the active enhancers and looking at the co binding. That's really great. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so one of my questions is actually about the uh, core, I mean, this repression that look mm, uh, by OTX to ATO7. Yeah, I maybe I, I don't know, kind of maybe I missed something here, but I would, um, I would think that if it is the case that both genes would not be expressed, would be really uh, very little expressed or somehow get rid of each other. Very quickly. No, I understand. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, how I, would you how would you explain the dynamics between this uh, repression? Right, right. Uh, 
And yeah, my second question would be about the if you if you looked at the maybe uh, the length of the cell cycle, uh, the RTX two out of seven co-expressing cells. Yes, that's my two questions. All uh, right. So so the first question, I I think you know this this is a conceptual uh, you know idea because the only I think a reasonable interpretation for this co-binding because they drive the cells you know to, to different direction is that they mutually. Uh, you know, re, uh, they mutually, um, you know, uh, repress each other because uh, you know, uh, OTI two is responsible uh, responsible for uh, for the receptor and eight seven responsible for ganglion cells. But how this occurs, I don't think you know we know. But you are right that if that's the case, should you just see one versus another? Um, but my argument would be that there are shared upstream inputs to active the, activate both. And so that occurs, I mean, even transiently, uh, so that for the competition to happen, you know, you have to have both. I think that there's likely a stochastic mechanism. And also which way it goes is dependent not just on the presence of the two, two factor, but the relative activity of this two factor. So which one is stronger? Uh, uh, but but remember that it's not just OTF2 and A27. There are these other transcription factors. They are all you know come, kind of coming together. Uh, so there is, I think this kind of competition, although as I said, it's still uh, conceptual, will lead it to a final uh, single outcome because we don't see in normal development a hybrid situation. You, you know, you always see one phase versus another. You never see, you know, a cell being, you know, not knowing where to go. You know what I mean? So that's my thinking. I, I think it's a trend because eventually, if you become a ganglion cell, you will lose the expression of OTF2 for sure. I mean, eventually you'll lose uh, A7 as so well. And then if you become a um, photoreceptor, you're going to lose, uh, you know, A7 expression. So I think it's a dynamic uh, you know, process. All right, let's move to Vladimir and then Gulab. Hi, Xu Chan, uh, thank you. I learned a lot from your talk, very interesting work. Oh, thank so you. My, I have two questions. My first question is uh, whether light plays any role in the development of ganglion cells. So they develop relatively early, but in parallel with the cause. So I was wondering whether either signaling through the cause or through, you know, intrinsically through the melanopsin expressing cells, plays any role in the development of the ganglion cells or maybe in the connect the development, the, the synaptic connections that they form? Right. Okay, that, that's your first question? <laughs> yeah, that's my first question. <laughs> okay, can I answer now? First, I, 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 the, the answer to that is not known. As you are aware, you know, the melanopsin uh, positive cells or, or IPRGCs, uh, you know, and plays an important role or light actually plays an important role in the vasculature uh, development later on, right? Uh, but I don't think anybody has done a kind of study to, you know, control the light and see how, um, you know, ganglion cell, I mean, uh, cell differentiation in general is affected. But I actually would say um, that at the state, you know, where I study, study E14.5, the uh, IPRGCs are there, or at least their pre precursors are there, but the melanopsin is not expressed yet. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, so, but yeah, we don't know, you know, whether, you know, light play anything. Okay. All right. And my second question is, it's, uh, I think the, the development of the outer retina of photoreceptors has been studied extensively, and there is a known kind of transcription regulation network that controls the development of roads and the different contacts, but you only have three to four different cell types there. Whereas for this case of ganglion cells, you have dozens and dozens of different cell types. Yes. So do you think that the transcription regulation there is a matter of few transcription factors and the relative dose of each? Or do you think that each ganglion cell type requires its own transcription factor set to, to be developed? Right. So, so that that's actually a, a very important question. So, um, um, 
all the types, the ganglion cell types, I would say, uh, so their initial um, uh, genesis are uh, subject to the same genetic cascade starting from A to seven. Because if you don't have A to seven, you essentially don't you know lose all the ganglion cells. So that's for one. But on the other hand, the sub uh, classes or, or types of ganglion cells, each type likely are subject to the regulation of you know a few transcription factors. But for most of them, we don't know. Although you know there are single cell studies that have identified transcription factors uh, or, or combination of transcription factors that mark individual types. Uh, but for most of them, we don't know uh, how they are generated. Uh, clearly, they are generated through different times, different, you know, different types that gener uh, a few of them actually have been identified. Uh, identified. For example, the IPRGCs you just mentioned are all regulated by this transcription factor called the EOMAS, also known as the TBR2, because if you don't have that, that is the downstream of BOFF2 and ISL1. So if you don't have uh, TBR2, you essentially lose uh, most of the, uh, if not all, of the IPRGCs. But for most of the other types, we don't know much. And that's, I think, you know, will be an active uh, area of research. Uh, You'll be busy for a while. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Hi, Dr. Moon. Great yes. work. Uh, I'm just curious about a few things. Uh, so you mentioned the optic nerve is formed, uh, I'm assuming is formed uh, uh, before, right? So I'm trying to understand when you have this differentiation going, how does that information is relate to optic nerve to the brain? Because they're subdividing uh, or differentiating, right? So their function is changing. And if that information provides any uh, information to when in glaucoma when you're looking for regeneration of optic nerve and stuff. Uh, that's that's a, that's a good question. So um, I, I have to admit, you know, I, my lab does not study uh, axon projection, uh, you know, per se. But on the other hand, I would like to point out, that, you know, downstream of these transcription factors. Many of the genes that are involved in um, uh, axon, you know, projection to the brain are reg are regulated by them. So when you activate or differentiate the ganglion cells, you're not just making uh, genes or proteins that are involved in the function of the ganglion cells. You're also making uh, uh, proteins that are involved in uh, pathfinding or projection. Uh, so many of them actually have been studied, but not by my lab. And, and as how is that related to regeneration? I think you know um, what we learned from development can definitely be used to reprogram, you know, either stem cells or mirror glial cells to ganglion cells. Uh, and actually, uh, there's a recent uh, uh, study from Tom Risk group actually. Um, uh, tangentially uh, involved, um, uses pop 2 and IL-1 to push the Miller cells toward the ganglion cell phase. But regarding making the axons to make a connection to the brain, you know, uh, uh, to make the axons, you know, from those regenerated uh, ganglion cells, I think that's a very, very tall order at least for now. Uh, it, it will take some effort and some time to get to that point. Thank you. All right, sense? we yeah. had a fantastic conversation. We have the last two questions for today, Rafał and then Zach. Okay. Hello, Dr. Mo. I'm Rafał. I'm a postdoc in Chris Poczewski lab. Thank you okay. for this fantastic talk. Uh, I have a general question related to Dr. Zaudi's question. What is the timeline of optic nerve formation? Um, say, say it one more time. Uh, what is the timeline of optic nerve formation from uh, retinal ganglion cells? When does it happen? In oh, oh, <clears throat> excuse me. It happens very, very early. So the first, uh, I believe, um, the first axon 
you know, the axons are generated as the ganglion cells are made. So the first uh, ganglion cell um, is made in the mouse at around E11, E11.5. And once they are made, they, they, they will generate the axons and protect the brain. Uh, so the first axon, uh, which are called the pioneer axons, I believe they reach to the brain at around uh, E13, E14. So um, obviously this is a dynamic process because the ganglion cells are generated over a time window. So as new ganglion cells uh, generated, their axons, axons will continue to project to the brain. But you may, uh, you are also, you know, uh, aware there, there are many, many targets, you know, uh, in the brain, you know, by random ganglion cell axons. But that essentially is a black box. You know, we really, really don't know what decides which ganglion cell goes to which target. Although, you know, um, there are some process is known. For example, you know, you have ipsilateral versus the, you know, contralateral projection, right? There has been, you know, some key regulators like ZIC2, uh, ILA2, even the substance that are involved in that process that have been, you know, studied by uh, Carol Mason's group at Columbia. Okay, thank you so much. Sure. Hi, Dr. Mu. Uh, yeah. Thank you for that really interesting talk. So my question was uh, kind of revolving around the role of juxtacrine signaling and commitment to different cell feeds. What is signaling? Is signaling? So like signaling between neighboring cells. Oh yeah, sure, uh, sure, sure. That, that plays yeah. a role in expression of some of these transcription factors um, yeah. to kind of control the density of certain retinal ganglion cell types within a given area versus another area. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Um, so what kind of signals have you identified or other groups identified that kind of influence, maybe even just the epigenetic remodeling um, relating to commitment to different cell fates? Right, right. So, so there, there, there are several pathways that have been you know, um, uh, identified or studied to be involved in uh, genesis uh, or you know, cell uh, differentiation. And, uh, the most notable one is the notch pathway actually is shown here. Mm -hmm. So this actually has been studied, you know, from Drosophila line. And uh, so neurogenesis actually follows a uh, kind of a, a um, signaling paradigm called lateral uh, uh, inhibition. So basically you have one cell having active, uh, I mean, you have surrounding cells having uh, active notch signaling, but that inhibits a neighbor cell uh, and that cell has inhibited, uh, you know, notch signaling and began to differentiate. And I, I'm making it very, very simple, but this is not identified in the mouse, uh, but uh, likely, and based on what, you know, has been uh, uh, found, you know, in the field to be the case. But this is much harder to study because there are multiple ligands. You can see here, three of them here. There are also multiple notch, uh, which is a receptor, you know, uh, genes being expressed. Uh, so clear notch is, you know, plays a, a, a very important role in the cells, you know, neighbor uh, communication between neighboring cells. And also um, another interesting pathway is, is the sunny hedgehog pathway. And that actually happens is a feedback me mechanism. So what happens that, so you go from here all the way to the differentiated cells, and these cells will then secrete sunny hedgehog. And this sunny hedgehog molecules will go back to the progenitor cells, which express the receptors, the patched receptors. And then that, that, that signaling will inhibit the pro, uh, uh, differentiation, but the promote proliferation. So it's a kind of a, a mechanism to, to balance proliferation and the differentiation. But that's not a direct, you know, neighbor you know, interaction. Do you know or have any hypotheses about no, whether, this that, is no. This is whether no. that's impacted in the ATO7 null mice? Say it one more time. Yes, yes, because in the ATO7 now, or even in the POF2 and the ISL1 mice, 
So mm -hmm. sunny hedgehog is expressed there, but when the ganglion cells are gone, this signaling is gone. <coughs> so basically you have reduced the proliferation. So in all the three lines, you have a much thin retina, much thinner retina. So that's largely because of that. Actually other uh, uh, signaling pathway may also uh, be involved, including GDF, uh, 11, GDF8, GDF11, which is the, you know, uh, BMP molecules. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, you all are very welcome. And thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.